Water is one of the most important substances on Earth. All plants and animals must have water to survive. If there was no water, there'd be no life on Earth. People rely on water every day to drink, to cook with, to wash their bodies, their clothes, their eating utensils, to keep our houses and communities clean. People rely on water for recreation and maintaining our lawns and our parks. We use water to grow our food that we eat, from plants and vegetables to our meats and our fish. We use water in our industries to make the products that we use. We even use water to make the electricity that we consume every day. Throughout history, water was used as a symbol to express devotion or purity. Some cultures, like the ancient Greeks, went so far as to worship gods who were thought to live in and command the waters. Entire cities were built by considering the location and availability of pure drinking water. The place of gathering was usually around the well, which is perhaps why today the following trend in building fountains is in the middle of towns. Traditional and modern medicine have also been making use of the physiological and psychological properties of water in all forms of hydrotherapy. We all know the simple yet effective calming qualities of a warm bath, or even the invigorating qualities of a cold shower. For centuries, numerous healing springs located all around the world have been recognized for their benefits. The hot springs and mineral spas in California are just one example. Today, contrary to the past, our recent developed technological society has become indifferent to this miracle of life. Our natural heritage, our rivers, our creeks, and our oceans have been exploited, mistreated, and contaminated. The population decline of the ocean and fish species in our creeks and streams, the appearance of green algae in our rivers, the stenches and the slimes that come as a result of putrefaction of our water are all clear signs of the extent of the disruption of our aquatic ecosystems. Governments and water authorities will have us believe that it's safe and we shouldn't worry about this global alarm. But awareness and action lies entirely upon us as we need to become our own educators, physicians, and innovators. Socrates once said, an unexamined life is a life not worth living. So questioning everything and anything that anybody tells us until it makes sense is of utmost importance. If it is the truth, it'll feel right, it'll set you free, and it'll lead you on a road to discovery and recovery. Let's talk about, let's learn about, and let's think about water as a resource, as a commodity, and as a necessity for life on earth. This unit will contain the water basics and the water cycle. We'll then take a look at surface and groundwater and how we use water. And then we're going to take a look at some case studies around the world where the situation of water availability, especially clean water, is in crisis. And we'll finish up this unit on water about talking about the economics and the state of water as a resource and a commodity to be sold. We are the water planet. The blue marble floating 93 million miles away from our star. Our planet lies smack dab in the middle of the habitable zone of our solar system, where water is able to exist in all three phases, solid, liquid, and gas on the surface of our planet. We're just the right distance from our star for this to occur. Perfect for life. The processes about which water moves and changes state on our planet are both beautiful and necessary. Water readily cycles through our atmosphere, the surface and the subsurface of the earth, making it a renewable resource and a commodity. It is water that provides all life on our planet. Let's start by taking a look at some of the unique properties of water and how it exists on, our, on the surface of our planet. All right, let's start here with the basics of water and we're gonna be looking at water as a molecule. 
The water molecule is an interesting one, and we're going to be working with a little bit of your chemistry knowledge here. It shares what's called a covalent bond. That should be a refresher. And a covalent bond is one where two atoms share electrons. All right, and in the case of the water molecule, uh, we have an oxygen molecule and a hydrogen, or an oxygen atom and a hydrogen atom. The oxygen atom has two electron outer shells, uh, both which are filled with electrons, and it's in that second outer shell that the hydrogen atom is going to share two electrons. Now, what's interesting is that uh, the H2O molecule, where these two hydrogen atoms share electrons, is going to be on one side of the molecule so that you have a 105 degree angle. Now, what's interesting about that is that because, because that covalent bond is unequal, the angle of the HOH bond, it leaves one side of the water molecule uh, net positive and the other side net negative. So you have this uh, unequal molecule. We call that a polar molecule. as opposed to one that's balanced and there's no net positive or negative. All right, so covalent bonds are pretty strong. Um, they're stable. And we see another example of a covalent bond in the methane molecule. So real quick, I'll give you another example. Uh, let's take a look at the methane molecule. So you have a carbon that's surrounded by its two outer shells, which are filled. And if you remember your chemistry, the first shell is two electrons, the second shell, and for the third for that matter, both have eight electrons. And the methane molecule has four hydrogens. All right, so that's what the methane molecule looks like, CH4. It's another example of a of a covalent bond, methane, otherwise known as natural gas. All right, we'll be talking about that. So that's another example of a covalent bond. Greenhouse gas, there's no net positive or negative because the hydrogens are all balanced around the central nucleus of the carbon atom. So, so there you go, it's just another example of a covalent bond. So let's erase that. All right, more interesting facts about water as a molecule at the molecular level it actually shares a second type of bond called hydrogen bonding so with hydrogen bonding we're going to take advantage of that unequal covalent bond where one side of the water molecule is net positive and let's look down here at figure 2.5b uh, we're going to look at this this water molecule right here because the hydrogens are on this side of this water molecule, it's a net positive on this side of the molecule and a net negative on this side. So what's going to happen is a hydrogen, which is positive, is going to be attracted to the negative side of the oxygen atom. So you ha that's a, a hydrogen bond right there. That bond, which is the weakest type of bond, but it's very real, is going to give water very unique properties. We're going to go through those in a second. Things like surface tension, uh, capillary action. So hydrogen bonding is where there's an attraction between a hydrogen and an oxygen of two separate molecules. All right, another example of hydrogen bond occurs within DNA, the biological molecule that carries the genetic code for all organisms. So there's two examples of hydrogen bond. One exists in our water and the other exists in DNA. Can you think of the third type of bond? Remember your chemistry? There's covalent bonds, there's hydrogen bonds, and then there are, you can say it out loud, ionic bonds. And if you remember your chemistry, you remember where ionic bonds are where two atoms actually transfer electrons between them. So this is where one atom is going to become electron deficient and the other one becomes electron rich. All right, and I'll give you a quick example here. An example of ionic bonding is NaCl. All 
right, so let's look at our NA and our CL. All right, there you go. Quickly sketched the NaCl, and we have not bonded yet because our sodium atom, all right, where we have our inner electron shell is full, the second electron shell is full, but the third electron shell has seven out of eight, all right, and it's going to want to react with the Cl, which has its inner shell is full, its second shell is full, and its outer shell only has seven of eight. So what we're going to do is we're going to transfer our one electron over to the Na or the Cl, the chlorine, which is going to leave our sodium molecule net positive, all right, because it lost an electron. Because our chlorine atom gained an electron, we're going to be net negative. And as they transfer that electron back and forth, they create a bond, NaCl, which is carbon table salt. So in an ionic bond, to refresh your memory, those are not as strong as covalent bonds because they do dissolve in liquids and solvents like water. All right, the charged atoms are called ions, and the sharing of that electron or the transfer of that electron creates that bond. All right, it creates an imbalance which holds the two atoms together. So there's a little chemistry refresher there on bonding, and please keep that in the back of your mind here as we go through these unique properties of water, which are unique because of the molecular structure of water and that covalent and the hydrogen bonding between water molecules. So let's take a look here. The first unique property of water is surface tension. Demonstrated here by our friend the water strider, the cohesion of water molecules at the surface of water creates this sort of skin at the surface and that surface tension uh, is also responsible for making water droplets smooth and more or less spherical as they cling to water faucets before dripping but think about in the previous slide how we talked about that hydrogen bonding that hydrogen bond allows for this surface tension All right, this almost artificial skin on the surface of water very unique property of water. A second unique property of water would be capillary action. We've all seen this in effect when we've tried to soak up a spill. All right, this happens when adhesion of water molecules is stronger than cohesion. All right, so for example, the absorption of water by this paper towel here in the bottom left, you've all seen how water will crawl up the paper towel. That's adhesion occurring. All right, so this capillary action, this almost suction of water up a material. All right, you can also see this in effect over here, where water is actually being almost vacuumed up. And the smaller the tube, the smaller the capillary, the more action there is. Okay, and they show you here. So the tube A would have the highest amount of capillary action. The thinner the tube, the, the more capillary action. And we see that in nature. If I turn the slide here, if you remember us talking about trees in class, specifically, specifically the ash tree, the ash tree has all these little capillaries going up inside the tree, all right, in the tissues of the tree, these small, thin little capillary tubes that transport water up and down the tree. So that's one of the ways that water goes up into the tops of the trees, into the leaves. That's how the tree gets itself water. So that's what makes the emerald ash borer, that invasive species, so devastating. Because the emerald ash borer will literally come here and crawl and eat and chew through those capillaries, severing the ability of the tree to provide water up and down. All right, so the tree is using capillary action to transport water. And the emerald ash borer is unfortunately destroying that ability in these trees. All right, another unique property of water is the ability of water to be in all three phases at the Earth's surface. Incredibly, water is unlike most substances on Earth. Most substances on Earth are either a solid or a liquid or a gas at the surface of the Earth at atmospheric pressure. But water can be all three. 
if it were like those other substances, there probably wouldn't be life on Earth, or it would be very different. All right, but because of cohesion, it can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas at surface temperature. So to refresh your memory, water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, or 32 Fahrenheit, and it boils at 100 degrees Celsius, or 212 Fahrenheit. All right, so also because of this hydrogen bonding, it takes lots of energy to change the temperature of water. So water inside organisms are protected from wide temperature fluctuations. So it's almost like a built-in mechanism to protect organisms from extreme temperature fluctuations. So think about a fever. Your normal body temperature, and you are mostly water, your normal body temperature is 98.6, but only 100 degrees, only one degree change, 1.4 degree change, is a fever. Water inside of us is almost like our protection from wide temperature fluctuations. I mentioned on the previous slide that it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. And what I'm referring to is the specific heat property of water. It takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. So let's think about it in nature and ecosystems. If you have energy coming into this lake, it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of that water. So what we have is we have, we have a climate regulator. All right, areas or regions that are adjacent to large bodies of water, like lakes or oceans, they're going to be more moderate climates because it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of that water. So what we have is water holding summer heat as it gets into the winter months, and then as the atmosphere cools, the water will release that heat. But what it does in turn is it keeps the land adjacent to it a little bit warmer later into the year. As opposed to the opposite, in the springtime, the water is very cold. All right, so it's giving cold air off in the springtime. So as the land around it heats up, the water is still a little bit cooler. It's going to keep the areas adjacent to it a little bit cooler in, later into the spring into the summer. So you have this climate moderator of in, in water. All right, more properties of water that are unique. I think we're on five. Water takes up more space when it changes into the solid form. All right, so as water freezes, it takes on a lattice structure. So in liquid water, if you could zoom in and see these molecules, they'd be floating all over the place with no real order. All right, but in the ice, if you can zoom down in and look at the structure, you could see you would see this lattice structure. All right, that's a very poor image, but hopefully you get the image, the uh, the idea. So water takes up more volume as it freezes. So as it freezes, it takes on this lattice structure, which is interesting because water be is becomes denser as it cools down. It becomes denser as it cools all the way down to about four degrees Celsius. So colder water will sink. All right, that's natural convection. Warm stuff rises, cool stuff sinks. So cooler water will sink un until it gets to about four degrees. Then as the water starts to freeze, it takes on this lattice structure and it'll begin to float. So lower than four degrees, as water gets colder than that, it'll actually become less dense, which is very interesting and unique property of water. It's almost as if nature is protecting itself. Imagine if ice sank. Lakes would freeze from the bottom up. As a result, few aquatic organisms would survive cold climates, and we'd have a different place, a different planet. All right, so luckily for us, ice floats, and our rivers and lakes and our water surfaces freeze from the top down, which allows life to flourish underneath the ice layer. The last unique property of water is that it can be, it can act as a solvent. Water has the ability to dissolve substances, and the polar molecules form bonds with other polar molecules and then transport those substances various distances. 
All right, this explains the high concentration of dissolved ions in seawater. It also explains the ability of living organisms to store all kinds of different types of minerals and molecules in water within our cells. One way to get things into our bodies is through water, those things being dissolved within the water. Unfortunately, many toxic substances can also be dissolved in water, which makes them very easy to transport into the environment and into food chains. So that ability of water to dissolve things is good, but it can also be a way to get toxic, substance, toxic substances into the environment. That's a little bit of the basic properties and unique qualities of water. Hopefully you're already gaining an appreciation and you're pumped up ready to go and learn a little bit more about water as a natural resource.